Hi folks, you're very welcome to the Science Gallery this evening. Uh, we'd kind of kindly ask you guys to take note of your exits, uh, the door you came in or the door on this side here, and also if you could switch off your phones, that would be wonderful. Um, from Arctic ex expeditions to deep sea discovery, Life of the Edges has explored frontiers and limits and has tried to boldly push the boundaries of space, humanity, technology, and determination. Um, extreme activities such as polar exploration and deep sea diving, um, mountaineering and space missions, um, long distance sailings create extraordinary physical and psychological demands. Dealing with fear is only the start. So I'm delighted to welcome uh, author and psychologist Emma Barrett, who is, is joining us this evening to consider what it takes to survive and thrive at the limits in remote and in dangerous environments. Emma is a professor of psychology, security and trust at the University of Manchester and she is co-author uh, with Paul Martin um, of Extreme, Why Some People Thrive at the Limits. Uh, the book is actually uh, on sale in the shop in Science Gallery and I think there are some signed copies as well. And the event is brought to you with Oxford University Press. So if you could just put your hands together for Emma. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you very much to the Science Gallery Dublin uh, for letting me come and talk to you about one of my favourite subjects. Um, I've been told I have to try and keep this to less than an hour, so I shall do my best. Um, but there's a lot to talk about. Um, first of all, I want to take you back to the winter of 1911 in Antarctica. These three men, Birdie Bowers, Bill Wilson and Apsley Cherry Garrard, are members of Captain Robert Falcon Scott's Terra Nova expedition. They're about to set off on a five-week journey that's going to take them from their base camp at Cape Evans to Cape Crozier and back again. And it's a journey that's going to test them to the very limits of their endurance. Because it, in Antarctica in the winter, it's dark 24 hours a day. It's bitterly cold. Temperatures often reaching minus 60 Celsius. And these three men set off into the unknown on this brutal journey, dragging two heavy sledges, each laden with about 340 kilos of equipment and provisions across snow and ice. Now, these sledges were so heavy that it took two men to haul one sledge. They would drag one sledge away and then return for the second and drag that. So for every mile of progress that they made, they actually walked three. Every so often, one of the men would disappear suddenly into a deep crevasse and have to be hauled out. It was so cold that their teeth cracked, their fingers froze as soon as they took off their woolen gloves. If they touched those metal sledge runners, they were left with agonizing blisters, and they said that they felt like howling with the pain. It took them hours to set up camp each night, and they often struggled to pitch their tent in blizzard conditions. They had a di dinner of fatty meat paste called pemmican, and then they spent an hour chipping ice off their sleeping bags. And then they tried to sleep, but the cold was so intense that they were frostbitten even inside their bags, and the next day they were so tired, they sometimes only realized they'd fallen asleep when they stumbled and jolted awake. And here they are on their return five weeks later, looking actually, I think, remarkably well for their ordeal. But they've endured 35 days of some of the worst conditions faced by any human before or probably since. And when Cherry Garrard wrote about it some years later, he called his book The Worst Journey in the World. So why would you do something like this? So some of you might be familiar with this story and, and know, but for those of you who aren't, can you think of any good reason why anyone would put themselves through this? Well, it wasn't for an adrenaline rush. It wasn't for glory or fame or setting records. It was, appropriately enough, given where we are, it was in pursuit of scientific discovery. They'd gone to collect penguin eggs. And the reason they wanted penguin eggs was because Bill Wilson was a naturalist and he wanted to study them. The reason they had to travel so far was because that was the only way to reach the pen penguin rookery. The reason they travelled in winter was because that's when penguins lay their eggs. And Cherry Garrard talk, described it as the weirdest bird's nesting expedition there has ever been or ever will be. So I chose this example of human experience in extremes because Antarctica exemplifies many of the features of extreme environments that make them really challenging to humans. It's an environment where humans haven't evolved to exist. And this is the feature that's really central to the definition of extreme environments. So when psychologists and uh, other scientists talk about extreme environments, this is a, a very common definition that we use. It's settings that possess extraordinary physical, psychological, and interpersonal demands 
that require significant human adaptation for survival and performance. And it's not just polar exploration. So with my colleagues, we've examined research and accounts of activities like diving, long distance open ocean sailing, mountaineering, caving, space exploration, and some extreme sports as well. So some of these are environments you might only spend a few minutes in if you were skydiving, for example, or they might be environments where people would spend weeks uh, or sometimes years. So the physical demands, um, I think, probably are fairly obvious. So hostile climates, extremes of temperature, unusual forces like uh, physical forces like microgravity if you're in space, for example, low or high pressure if you're either under the sea or at the top of a mountain, lack of breathable, breathable gases. There's many ways that you can face injury and death, uh, including freezing, overheating, drowning, suffocating, starving, dehydrating, falling, being crushed, falling victim to disease, animal attack, or through agonizing decompression in injuries if you ascend too rapidly from a dive. So lots of nasty ways to die, and at the risk of laboring the point, they're very physically dangerous places. And these are pretty nasty, but nasty as they are, they're in some ways the least of the hazards because those psychological pressures can be as or more daunting uh, than the physical pressures. Dealing with fear and anxieties at the top of the list, but people in extremes also need to cope with other hardships like hunger, pain, squalor, sleep deprivation. Between moments of terror, they may endure days or weeks of monotony. And if you choose to go out there solo, you risk loneliness or even sometimes psychological breakdown. If you go out with other people, that mission involves being cooped up for weeks with the same group, and you need to be both tolerant and tolerable or risk really destructive interpersonal conflict. So let's give you some more examples of, of the kind of places that have been studied. So this is the entrance to Cheve Cave in Mexico. It's one of the deepest caves uh, in the world. So the first kilometre or so downwards includes sheer drops of 150 metres or more. It's got lakes, waterfalls, huge boulder fields, also tiny little crawl spaces and places called sumps, which is basically where uh, water has blocked your way and you have to become a diver uh, to pass through them. And the hardest part about caving comes, out, comes at the end when cavers are most exhausted. And sometimes it's called, coming out of Cheve, it's called climbing Everest in reverse. It's not a weekend potholing jaunt. Uh, it's a five or six week expedition with lots of risks from falling and asphyxiation, rabid bats, mi microbes, freezing temperatures, and the rest. And worst of all, I think, when your lamps are turned off, utter darkness. So it's no wonder that people find that sometimes caves can send them a little crazy, and there are reports of claustrophobia, anxiety, insomnia, hallucinations, and panic attacks uh, among cavers. Another example, climbing at high altitude. All the dangers of rock climbing, but with the added stress of hypoxia or lack of oxygen. Um, and we know that lack of oxygen interferes quite seriously with basic cognitive functions, your thinking, including alertness, motor coordination, and judgment. Without enough oxygen, you could be incapable of carrying out even the most simple tasks, remembering uh, new information, and it also interferes with your sleep. And it's even more dangerous because most people, when they're hypoxic, don't realize how impaired they are, and they can be overconfident in their abilities. And this is why you sometimes get people pushing on to a summit when really their judgment should have told them to turn around. Much quicker way of experiencing high altitude is by going up in a specially designed balloon. So some of you may remember Felix Baumgartner's Red Bull Stratos mission 2012. So you know, really extraordinary feat, and I won't take anything away from him from that. But this man, Joe Kissinger, did the same thing 50 years before. So here he is in the 1960s, about to step out of a cramped metal capsule suspended below a helium balloon. And down below there is New Mexico, around 20 miles below him. There's a sign actually at the edge, at the top of, of the capsule that says, uh, this is the highest step in the world. So he's wearing a pressure suit because at, at such extreme high altitudes, an unprotected body would suffer catastrophic damage. So the boiling point of water at 63,000 feet, which is about ha halfway up or so, is the same as body temperature. So if you weren't protected with a pressure suit, the bubbles would form inside you as water turns to gas, it'd block your arteries, they cause your body to swell, your lungs to hemorrhage, 
and your heart would soon stop pumping blood. But the good news is you probably wouldn't feel it because oxygen deprivation would have passed you out, knocked you out earlier uh, than all of that. So he made three high altitude jumps from helium balloons. And you know he was the first man to do this. He had no idea what was going to happen to him. Um, he nearly died the second attempt because uh, he ended up getting his parachute cords uh, stuck around his neck and nearly choked. The third jump, uh, one of his gloves leaked and his hand ended up swelling to about twice its size. But what he proved was that in a pressure suit and with a steady supply of oxygen, humans could survive stratospheric conditions, which was some information extremely useful to the US Air Force and to what became NASA. Another example, uh, solo circumnavigation, sailing around the world uh, alone, something that's been described by one author as 10 months solitary confinement with hard labour. So these men uh, are both sailors who entered the non-stop solo round the world Golden Globe yacht race in 1968, um, a, a race that was described by one author as a voyage for madmen. Um, only one man completed the voyage, that was Robin Knox Johnson. Some of you may have come across um, the, the man at the top, Donald Crowhurst. But the man at the bottom here is Bernard Matissier, who was a French sailor. Uh, he entered the race somewhat reluctantly, um, and, but he found the sailing completely addictive, and he abandoned the race and carried on sailing. He eventually went round the world twice, uh, <laughs> driven by the joy, he said, of being at one with nature and escaping from the modern world. Donald Crowhurst, um, if for any of you who've seen the film The Mercy or read, the, there's a couple of great books uh, about his, uh, his experiences. Um, he didn't really have a seaworthy boat and he didn't really have the personal skills uh, to tackle the journey, but he staked his home and his business and his pride on this adventure and winning that race. And for most of the race, he appeared to be making really good progress. Uh, but in fact, his readings were fabricated and in reality, he only stayed within the Atlantic. And his journals, which were later recovered, showed that he progressively lost touch with reality. And eight months after his departure, they found his empty boat. Uh, and it's believed he may have killed himself. So it's all pretty horrible uh, stuff. And yet, for centuries, people have gone into these uh, environments. They've exposed themselves to these horrible conditions. And so there's a question about why they do that. And we'll come back to that later. Um, but there's another question, which is, how on earth do you do that? Um, it's clear that some people need physical, you know, that people will need physical and mental strengths to deal with these hazards. But there's a question here about whether these are particularly unusual or whether they are, uh, w whether they're the sort of skills that any of us could have. So the question is, do you actually have to be superhuman uh, to survive and thrive in these extremes? Let's go back to the story of the winter journey, because this story suggests very strongly that you don't have to be superhuman. So Birdie Bowers, um, he's probably the only one of those three who'd really shown signs that he could be capable of the sort of feat that, that they undertook. Um, he was a well-traveled Navy man. He had a reputation for a strong constitution. He had a hunger for adventure. Um, he had very, lots of positive uh, qualities, made him a very good team player, modest, optimistic, hardworking, good sense, but not intellectually pretentious, just the sort of person you might expect to go on one of these. But I don't think you'd think the same of Bill Wilson and Apsi Cherry Garrard if you'd seen them uh, as younger men. Um, you might think the opposite, actually, of Bill Wilson. So when he, he's a doctor and a naturalist, and when he was a young man, he contracted a bout of tuberculosis that left him with very scarred lungs. But he didn't only serve on the Terra Nova expedition with Captain Scott, but also on the earlier discovery expedition, Scott's earlier discovery expedition, which included a 960-mile trek that he took with Scott and Shackleton. Cherry Garrard, he was upper class, he was educated, blessed with all the advantages of inherited wealth. He was the son of a major general and he was raised on stories of military adventure, but he wasn't really a very adventurous sort of person himself. According, according to Sarah Wheeler's biography, he was very quiet, uh, he was shy, and when he tried to join the army, he was turned down for being too neurotic. So. It's very interesting that these people who you wouldn't think of as uh, the sort of people who would take these kind of journeys um, actually take them and survive on them. Uh, and we find in our research actually an awful lot of other individuals who, like these three men, were fundamentally ordinary people choosing to do extraordinary things and often overcoming some deeply personal challenges, including physical health problems and mental health problems. So here's, here's one of them. This is Beth French. Um, she's an endurance swimmer. Um, she has done some really astonishing um, 
uh, long ocean swims, and last year took on the Ocean 7 Challenge, which is swimming the world's seven toughest ocean channels, including the Cook Strait in New Zealand and the Molokai Channel in Hawaii. Some of these challenges involve swimming for 20 hours straight, where you risk hypothermia, exhaustion, jellyfish stings, uh, and in one terrifying episode in Hawaii, being menaced by a shark. But she has a really interesting background um, that makes her a really unlikely adventurer. She spent most of her adolescent years suffering from an immune dysfunction. By the time she was 17, she was in a wheelchair. And it took her years to recover from that. But 20 years later, here she is taking on this kind of huge physical uh, challenge. Here's a, a, another unlikely adventurer, probably one of the most extraordinary adventurers you've probably never heard of. Um, her name is Barbara Hillary. She was born in New York and raised in Harlem, where, and she had a long and successful career in nursing. After she retired, she um, got lung, lung cancer. She survived, but only after surgery that removed about a quarter of her, her lungs. She went, after recovering from lung cancer, went to Manitoba to photograph polar bears, because it's something she'd always wanted to do. And when she was in Manitoba, she decided she really liked the Arctic. So much so that in April 2007, she became the first African-American woman to reach the North Pole on foot and ski at the age of 75. Not only that, she went on to trek to the South Pole in January 2011, age 79, first black woman to do both. When she was asked how she did it, she said, well, I was raised old school. The world doesn't owe you a damn thing. If you want something, you get up and you work for it. She's now still, she's still going and she's still planning her next adventure and I can't wait to see what that's going to be. So just a couple of uh, examples from the many that we've come across in our research. Um, and take it from me, there are many, many more like that. So fundamentally ordinary people doing really extraordinary things. So how do they thrive at the limits? What are the risks um, that they face and how do they overcome them? So I think to, to unpack what's going on when someone thrives or doesn't thrive in extreme environments, we need to start by understanding a little bit about stress uh, and stressors. So in scientific parlance, stress occurs when an individual is subject to demands that exceed or threaten to exceed their ability to cope with them. So the unpleasant and potentially harmful demands, the sources of stress are called stressors, and the sorry, psychological and physiological reactions they elicit are known as your stress response. And stressors can be physical stressors, we've talked about a lot of those, they can also be psychological and social stressors. So the stress that you feel when you're exposed depends on the demands, those stressors, but it also depends on your stress response. And extreme environments have stresses that make them objectively demanding by any standards. But the extent to which an individual is going to find them stressful will depend on how well they think they can deal with them, which in turn depends on factors like their skill, their experience, and their physical and mental state at the time when they experience it. In terms of how much stress a stressor might cause, individuals vary a lot in their coping ability. Uh, so they vary. Uh, Sorry, they vary in the stress that they experience under apparently similar conditions. So a situation that's highly stressful for one person may be tolerable or even positively stimulating for someone else. And for someone who's about to make their first parachute jump, for example, they're more likely to be stressed than someone who's successfully jumped many times before. So a lot of it depends on the person's assessment of their situation and what they might do about it which is why one of the most effective coping strategies in a stressful situation is to do things to get some sense of control uh, over the stressor. So if you're in control of a challenging situation, you tend to be less stressed by it than if you perceive yourself to be a passive victim of circumstance. Coping strategies may be directed at the stressor itself, so what we would call problem-focused coping, or they might be uh, directed at your emotional response to the stressor, so we call that emotion-focused coping. And the strategies you use in a, a stressful situation are going to depend on factors that are pretty much unique to you. So your skills, your experience, your personality, your beliefs, your physical health, and your social environment as well. And it depends on contextual factors like how hungry, sleep deprived, or sad you might be at the time. So the key thing here is to understand that you, is the way that you understand and react to the source of stress, which then determines how subjectively stressful it is. So quite often you won't be able to change any of the conditions that you're exposed to, but you might be able to control how you respond to them. 
So extreme environments are very varied, lots of sources of stress. We haven't got time to go into them all, but there are a few that are common across uh, some or all contexts. Uh, one of them uh, is fear, um, because all extreme environments are, by definition, risky. So I'll say first up, uh, right at the top, that fear is actually a really good thing. Uh, and a lot of people who go into extreme environments will say exactly the same thing. Fear is good. It's our early warning sign that, we have, uh, that we're in danger. Fearless animals don't run away from when predators are about. And we're built to be afraid for that reason. But fear can also be paralyzing and stop us acting when we can. So again, a bit of uh, science of, of fear, again, very uh, study for a very long time. Uh, and what the studies have shown is that fear has different com components. It's got a physical component. So when you're afraid, you've got those sweaty palms, the racing heart, rapid breathing, churning guts, wide eyes. These are all reactions that have evolved to help prepare you to run away or stand and fight if you have to. But it also has a cognitive or thinking component. So when you're facing a fear-inducing situation, you'll have a number of thoughts. Some of those thoughts are quite helpful. What exactly am I facing? What's the real danger? What can I do about it? Some of those thoughts are probably not very helpful, like I'm going to die, I'm going to fall, I'm going to let everyone down, we're going to lose everything. And then there's a behavioral component, which is the act of running away or hiding. And the interesting thing about fear is that all these three components are linked. So you can put people in a completely safe laboratory, tell them they're safe, so they know they are, tell them they can abort the experiment any time, and then make them breathe air with 35% of carbon dioxide, which makes you feel like you're suffocating. And you reliably induce feelings of intense fear and racing panicky thoughts. So the physiological reaction triggers the cognitive reaction. If you start ruminating about a fear-inducing situation, particularly if those thoughts are all about your own inability to cope, you can feel your stomach lurching and your pulse quickening, even sort of in anticipation of fear. So knowing that these components exist and that they're linked is the key to understanding how people act despite fear, how people are brave. They experience the first two components, the cognitive component, the phys physiological component, but they decouple these from the behavioral component. It also means that it gives you some tips on how to control fear. Uh, so one of those is to control your physical symptoms, which is why people talk about breathing and relaxing, and that helps to calm your thoughts. Alternatively, you can calm your thoughts and your physical sensations start to fade. One of the best ways of controlling those fearful thoughts would be to uh, focus on something else. So we talked to a, a world champion cliff diver called Gary Hunt, who before he jumps off these enormous cliffs, juggles, because that's his way of distracting him from the fear. So breathing and distraction are really good ways of calming yourself, but there's another way that you can prepare yourself to overcome fear using that cognitive route, the thinking route, and that's by reducing uncertainty about the risky or dangerous situation or reducing uncertainty about your own uh, ability to cope with it. So this is one of the world's best-known climbers, a man called Alex Honnold, doing something that most of us would find utterly terrifying. So he's free solo climbing, that's climbing without a rope. He's climbing a 500 meter wall here in Mexico. Uh, I don't know about you, but just watching it kind of makes my palms sweat a little bit, um, because fear also tends to be contagious. So the question is, is he reckless? <laughs> so the, danger, the dangers are incredibly re real. So he only has to miss a step or step on a bit of loose rock, uh, and it's pretty much game over, certain death. He's not going to come back from that. And it, it's, we, we'll have our own opinions about whether he's reckless or not. I think he probably isn't. And the reason, the reason why I say that is that he has climbed his entire life. He's been, he was climbing trees when he was so high. And it's pretty much all he's ever done for his whole life and all he ever does. Apart from giving talks and interviews, he, he just climbs. And that amounts to months and months and months of practice uh, with the same skills over and over again. And those skills become overlearned. And overlearning matters because overlearned skills are the ones that are least resistant to stress and they're most likely to persist even if you're absolutely terrified. So Honnold uh, has overlearned skills 
and he has a high ability and he has a high confidence in his ability, something that psychologists would call self-efficacy. It's that belief that you have that you can do something. And if you remember, I said that stresses have their biggest impact uh, when you don't think you can control them. And self-efficacy is something that reduces uncertainty about your response to that fear situation. The other thing that helps reduce uncertainty is planning and preparation about the nature of the situation you're going into. So in Honnold's mind, he's not being reckless. He can't eliminate the risk, and he won't ever say he does. But he does all he can to minimize it. So before each of these big solo climbs, he climbs the, the, the route uh, first with ropes until he's f thoroughly familiar with it, and he kind of um, cleans out the holes to make sure there isn't too much loose stuff in there. So he's reducing uncertainty about the situation there. So that's fear. That's probably the one that most people will think about in terms of going into extreme environments. Well, let me give you a couple which maybe you wouldn't have thought about so much. One of those is squalor. So life in extreme environments tends to be very dirty and smelly. Here's the uh, capsule from the Gemini 7 space mission back in 1963. So on the left is the actual capsule, and on the right, the astronauts Jim Lovell and Frank Borman standing inside a replica. Um, so you get a sense of how small it is. It's about the size of a front seats of a small car. They were stuck in there together, and the one on the left, obviously, for two weeks, wearing their space suits throughout, no showers and no toilets either. So they had to urinate and defecate into their underwear. And NASA being NASA put together a urine management system, but unfortunately it leaked. So Jim Lovell later said that this was like spending two weeks in a latrine. So imagine being those poor US Navy frogmen who opened the hatch after the Gemini splashed down in the ocean. And squall is a problem on larger uh, space vessels as well. There's a study out there, which I don't recommend you read before dinner, that goes through in absolutely nauseating detail all the human waste products that might be encountered by astronauts. So as well as urine and feces, they include hair and flakes of skin, pus, blood, vomit, and what they call microflora and microbial products, which basically means farts. So in addition to human waste, you might also get contamination from loose pieces of food and drink. And it's no wonder then that messy eating and poor toilet habits have been a source of considerable tension among astronauts. But it's not just in space. So most extreme mess missions are characterized by extremely limited washing facilities. So buildup of dirt is a very common feature. But why do I say it's a stressor? Because being dirty, in most cases, isn't actually that harmful to your health but it can be really psychologically stressful, and this is why. It's because people have a, a response to dirt, um, which is a disgust response, which can be very powerful. It's a universal human phenomenon, though the stimuli that trigger it are to some extent culturally moderated. So there are some things that disgust everyone, I apologize for this, regardless of cultural background, so feces, vomit, and putrid, fruit, food, putrid food are universally disgusting. They provoke something that we call core disgust. But beyond core disgust, people kind of vary in the things they consider to be disgusting, and individuals have very different standards uh, when it comes to hygiene. So if you squeeze together people who are easily disgusted with those who are completely indifferent to filth, you can see where the problems arise. And personal hygiene becomes a very predictable source of social conflict in confined environments. Another common stressor is pain. So it's the chronic aches and pains and sores um, right through to full-on agony in extreme environments. This is Tim Jarvis. He's, a, he's an Australian explorer. Um, he's probably best known for recreating a couple of um, historic, uh, famous 20th century polar expeditions. Uh, this one in 2007 was retracing the steps of Douglas Mawson, who was another Australian explorer, who in 1912 was crossing Antarctica with two companions. Uh, when one companion disappeared down a crevasse, taking with him six of their dogs uh, and the sledge. And unfortunately, the sledge that he took was the one that had almost all of their food supplies. So Mawson and his surviving companion, Xavier Mertz, had enough food for about 10 days, but they were around 300 miles from their nearest camp. So they knew that there wasn't going to be enough food to get them there. But there's not an awful lot else you can do except press on, so that's what they did. Uh, their food eventually ran low. I'm sorry to say, as a dog lover, they ended up eating their remaining dogs. Um, and eventually, though, they were suffering from very severe malnutrition. Their skin was peeling off all over their bodies, causing excruciating pain. Mertz became delirious and died, and Mawson continued on his own, with 100 miles still to go, almost no food left. He later 
wrote about how his hair and his beard was falling out in handfuls. He was bleeding continuously from his fingers and nose. And finally, after 30 days of this, he reached his camp. It was such an astonishing feat that some people claimed that he must have eaten Mertz, that there was no other explanation for how he was able to make it. And what Tim wanted to do was test whether on that same calorific intake that Mawson had, you could actually do it without eating your companion. <laughs> so that's what he set off to do, and he, and he made it. But Mawson had reportedly a very extraordinary capacity for enduring uh, pain, and Tim has as, as well. He had such a miserable time on that. It's so a way too little food, punishingly hard work and so on, uh, and a companion who kept look at him, looking at him very suspiciously and uh, <laughs> getting a little bit worried. But one of the things that Tim didn't uh, anticipate, and which Mawson didn't have to contend with, was that at those very low temperatures, if you've got fillings, they contract and they fall out. And that was what Tim said was the absolute agony. So why can some people withstand huge amounts of pain and other people not? Well, again, back to the science, there's always three. So there's three parts to pain. The first is the sensory component. It's the initial recognition of that uh, physical sensation. It's the stab of pain you get if, like Tim, your fillings contracted and dropped out. Then you get uh, an emotional response, a negative, aversive emotional response, and that's the uh, instinct that motivates us to make the pain go away. So it tells us that there's something wrong. But the third component, again, is back to cognition, it's back to your thinking. So it's worrying about the causes and the significance and the implications of pain. And it's that cognitive part, it's the thinking part, the worrying, that turns pain into suffering. So a person's subjective experience of pain depends on lots of things. So it depends on their current emotional state, their past experience, their knowledge, their personality and their expectations. If they happen to be very anxious, uh, that's not not good because it tends to make people focus on their uh, attention on their pain and that makes the suffering worse. But it does mean that almost any form of distraction can ease that suffering. So one way of dis getting distraction is by generating pain in another part of your body, which is by people will kind of scratch or blister skin or why cupping seems to work. But other forms of distraction uh, also work. So talking to other people, watching a film, taking yourself to your happy place. So finding ways of distracting your thoughts from the source of the pain. Another significant uh, stressor in extreme environments is bad sleep. So it's an endemic hardship. Most extreme uh, places, uh, anxiety and task demands usually end up reducing the quality and quantity of sleep that you get. So this is the amazing Ellen MacArthur. So in February 2001, she crossed the finishing line of the Vendée Globe race after 94 days at sea alone. She traveled 24,000 miles over three oceans, and she was, became the fastest woman to sail single-handedly around the globe. Now, you can't, sw you can't sleep normally when you're single-handed sailing. Uh, you have to keep waking up just to make sure your boat stays on track. Uh, so how did she cope? Well, she relied on napping, which turns out to be a really good way of counteracting the effects of bad sleep. So in total, she logged 891 naps. There clearly wasn't very much else to do except log your naps. Each of them lasting, on average, 36 minutes. Uh, also, as well as sleep deprivation, in extreme environments, you sometimes end up sleeping at really odd times. So astronauts, for example, uh, experience sunrise and sunset 16 times every 24 hours. So bedtime has to be pretty arbitrary. Uh, and the places you sleep tend to be quite interesting as well. And bad sleep is really important in extreme environments because it has such corrosive effects on mental and physical well-being. So it disrupts uh, your thinking, it gives you impairments in attention, your vigilance drops, your reaction time slow, your judgment is impaired, your memory is impaired, your communication skills are impaired. So these are all really important skills to have in extreme environments and they're all impaired by bad sleep. Tired people are more prone to get sad and they tend to be less emotionally robust. They're also less sociable and get more irritable and they don't communicate very well. So sleep, severe sleep deprivation as well can sometimes induce feelings of persecution and paranoia. So it's not very good for your interpersonal relationships either. There was a study in 2014 that looked at astronauts' uh, sleep, sleep patterns of astronauts, before and after shuttle and International Space Station missions. And NASA mandates, again, it's a very NASA thing to do, they mandate astronauts must have at least eight and a half hours of protected time each night, or what they designate as night for sleep. What this study showed was that target was only met around 8% of the time. So most of the time, the astronauts were chronically sleep deprived. 
Some of them admitted that they used um, sleeping tablets. In fact, about 75% of them said they tried sleeping tablets at one point or another. Um, but the researchers found they didn't actually have much benefit uh, in terms of their cognitive performance and also made them feel groggy during the during the daytime. And they pointed out, well, what happens if you have to suddenly get up in the middle of the night to deal with an emergency if you've taken a sleeping pill? It's probably not a great idea. So all the evidence is pretty clear that uh, sleep should be given a high priority on extreme missions, and you probably ought to consider it uh, to be mission critical. Another stressor that you might not think of in extreme environments is monotony. So there's two sorts. One is sensory deprivation. So as in here, this is a photo of Antarctica, as far as you can see, just white uh, snow. The other form of monotony, of course, is not having enough to do. So sensory monotony is a really interesting phenomenon. You get it in Antarctica, you also get it on wide open oceans, and basically anywhere where you've got a monotonous landscape. This is uh, Felicity Ashton, British explorer, who in 2012 became the first woman to ski alone and unsupported across Antarctica. It's about 1,000 miles in punishing conditions. So very physically demanding, but also very psychologically demanding. She said uh, that she's, she was scared pretty much every moment of that journey. Uh, she was very lonely at times. She had some emotional ups and downs and periods of depression. But the most interesting uh, thing, I think, about her experience is the way that she hallucinated. So she had periods of auditory hallucinations. So she would speak to the sun, which is not that unusual. What is unusual is when the sun starts speaking back to you. Uh, she also hallucinated pictures. So she saw floating hands and floating faces. But the most memorable uh, hallucination she had was going through an ice field, uh, being led by little bald men riding dinosaurs in front of her. So hallucinations are surprisingly common, uh, including in normal life, but they can be pretty frightening and stressful unless you know that they're not that unusual. Um, luckily for Felicity, she'd been warned by a psychologist before she went that she was going to experience these, so she kind of found them in amusing rather than terrifying. Um, but certainly other explorers who've experienced this have found it terrifying. A less extreme form of monotony is just simply not having enough to do. So if there are any divers in the audience, you'll probably know that the pleasures of diving have to be paid for through very long periods of decompression. So you come up very slowly um, to the surface. Uh, and what do you do on those kind of stops, which could last for sort of 15 or 16 hours in some cases? Well, one diver says he meditates. Uh, other divers have said they use their dive computers to play games, and other divers say that they read magazines. And we didn't, Paul and I didn't believe this when we were told this, so Paul went home being Paul and kind of soaked a magazine for a long time to see, to see if it came back. Yeah, it does, it holds up pretty well. So, for actually reading magazines. Mountaineers also spend an awful lot of their time sitting around and waiting for a weather window. So there was a study um, a, a little while ago where climbers kept a, a diary of activities during a Himalayan expedition of around 40 days. And only about 4% of that time was actually taken up uh, climbing. The rest was just sleeping or sitting around or eating and talking. So the solution to this is pretty obvious. Make sure you have enough to do. Make sure you take enough books. Um, and quite often people don't. That's easier said than done if, you're, uh, if your um, stay is unexpected. It's a major problem, not having enough to do, if you happen to be stranded for weeks or months at a time with a small number of other people. The strain of having, caused by having nothing to occupy your time and attention leads to lethargy and depression, but it also exacerbates social conflict. And this is what happened to the first humans who spent the winter in Antarctica. This is the Belgica. Uh, it was a Belgian expedition with a multinational crew set out to explore Antarctica back in 1897. They were almost shipwrecked on the way, so they arrived late, and they also arrived fairly jittery, and they ended up getting trapped in pack ice, and the 18 men on board were doomed to winter over. The crew was already divided along national lines. Uh, they had some language difficulties, and the divisions just got worse and worse as they all succumbed to depression, uh, scurvy, uh, and mental breakdown. So one man just developed hysteria, became temporarily deaf and dumb. Another man leapt overboard onto the ice and said he was going to walk back to Belgium. Another one died of scurvy. Uh, they couldn't bury him, so they just dropped him through a hole in the ice, but he didn't go. He just kind of stayed bobbing by the, the ship, so really unnerving for them. And there was also considerable social conflict, um, again, arising from misunderstandings between different language groups. So this conflict arises because of monotony. People just get very bored of each other in those kind of circumstances. Uh, and particularly, uh, those problems are particularly exacerbated when there's a clash of personality, cultural profession. So how serious can it get? 
Well, here's Valeri Ryumin and Nikolai Badarin uh, on one of their space missions, both experienced cosmonauts, looking very happy. This is what Ryumin said later. <laughs> All the conditions necessary for murder are met if you shut two men in a cabin and leave them together for two months. He was quite right. Uh, so it's not really surprising that space agencies have spent a lot of time and energy and money on research looking at how people interact in small groups in isolated and confined and unusual uh, situations. Here's an example. This was um, uh, now a kind of infamous isolation experiment that involved three international crews uh, running from July 1999 to April 2000. So the aim of this study was to see um, how people coped on long duration space missions. So they mocked up a space station with different modules and, and hatches, and they locked 12 people in there in three crews of four. So one of those crews was entirely Russian. Uh, Crew two was three Russians and one German, and crew three, this is crew three, was a Russian, uh, an Austrian, a Japanese, and a, a Canadian woman. So what happened was that different crews spent different periods of time in isolation from one another and then coming together, and ground control would control the hatches. So it's a fairly standard sort of isolation experiment, but it all went horribly wrong. So the Russian crew got on really well with crew number two, which also had mostly Russians. And then crew three arrived, um, and they didn't get on so well with crew three. And then, because it was the turn of the century, it was a millennium party, there was alcohol consumed, there were knives brought out, two of the Russians got into a very bloody fight, and one of the other Russians sexually assaulted the Canadian woman. So understandably, the members of crew three uh, were pretty upset. They uh, left, they blocked up the hatches so that their module was isolated from the other. The Japanese man left early, and then the other three just fell out with each other. So it was a pretty, pretty disastrous experiment. So researchers afterwards are trying to work out what on earth had gone wrong. Uh, and the answer is language difficulties, impaired communication, and cultural differences. So the Russians thought that the crew three had just overreacted to all of these incidents that would be completely normal in Russian culture. They hadn't done any work beforehand to try and get the crew members to, to uh, get to know each other. They had no cultural uh, training. Uh, no, they were being selected for their technical expertise and not for their social compatibility. So lesson learned. So what can you do? Well, now uh, space agencies spend a lot of time helping uh, astronauts and cosmonauts to learn each other's language, understand the cultures, and talk about shared values and different ways of seeing the world, and making sure also that people keep busy because it's sitting around with nothing to do that's most corrosive. So before we finish, um, we've talked about some of the, the stresses, some of the risks, and how people cope with them. We probably ought to touch on the rewards. The problem is that this is really complicated. It's another lecture in itself because the motivations themselves are really complex. Um, we haven't found in our research or looking at other people's research any simple answers to this. Different people do the same thing for different reasons. Two people might be doing complete, two completely different things for the same reason. Most people have multiple motivations. And also to complicate it further, most of the time the reasons why people start to get involved in extreme activities is not the reason why they continue being involved. So motivations change. So let's address one of the, uh, the popular assumptions out there. So uh, a lot of people think that people who go into these extreme environments must be adrenaline junkies. They're in it for the adrenaline in buzz. And that is true for some. Uh, so there are some people who do uh, say that the adrenaline rush is part of their motivation to seek out extreme situations. But it tends to be a bit more complicated than that. So there's a personality trait called sensation seeking, which has been studied since the 1960s. And people who score highly on measures of sensation seeking tend to show a strong preference for novel and intense experiences, like base jumping, for example, and a willingness to take risks to, ta to have those experiences. Some psychological studies have suggested that people attracted to base jumping uh, and skydiving and those kind of extreme sports do indeed score more highly on measures of sensation seeking compared to, say, golfers or people doing judo. <laughs> But that's not true for most other people who go into extreme activities. Um, and one of the reasons is that to achieve the sort of high level of performance that you need in those very risky situations needs a great deal of self-discipline, needs hard training and careful preparation, and you need to be able to step away when you, you judge that you can't control the risks. And these aren't really the behaviours of someone who's only after excitement and thrills. It's a lot harder than that. 
And also, when you consider a lot of the examples of environments that we've discussed already, they're not really ones where an adrenaline rush is a good thing. So if you fall through the ice into freezing water or down a crevasse, you do get an adrenaline rush, but it's not fun. And even those who are in it just for that physical thrill, or, or partly for the physical thrill, do also describe some more complex reasons. So there's a psychologist that I've worked with called Eric Brimer up at Leeds Beckett, who's done some great work with base jumpers, so the sort of people who jump off cliffs. And they talk about it in almost a spiritual uh, way. It's a way in which their life changes and uh, the world uh, expands for them. Sometimes those spiritual rewards seem to be linked to the fact that and many of these kind of extreme activities demand intense focus. Uh, so you, you remember Alex Honnold climbing on that uh, rock face? Alex is, is one of the least reflective people, and you ask him why he does it. Uh, he just says, well, I'm not thinking... Well, I say, what, do you, what are you thinking about when you're climbing? He says, oh, don't think about anything. That's kind of the point. But this is uh, Dean Potter, um, and Dean Potter very sadly died in 2015 in a wingsuit accident. He, but he's someone who would have scored highly on sensation seeking. He did a lot of different extreme sports, but he worked very hard at them. So as well as being a wingsuit flyer, he was also a free solo climber. There he is with his dog, Whisper, um, who hasn't taken the sensation seeking test, as far as I know. Uh, he's a base jumper, he was a base jumper, and he was also a slack climb walker. Um, but the interesting thing about Dean Potter is he's quite poetic about the way he talks and quite self-reflective when he talks about why he does it. So he says that, he said, I do this to get really deep into the zone. I get to a place where I disappear completely, where I merge with a rock, where time slows down, my senses are unbelievably heightened, and that's why I climb. I crave these experiences. And then he added, I certainly don't climb to get on top of rocks. So what he's describing there is a psychological state called flow. It's an intense mental state of engagement which occurs when someone's fully immersed in a demanding activity that's challenging you at the very limits of your skill. So people in the state of flow are utterly absorbed by the task that they're performing and they lose track of time and they feel in control and they talk about having an intense mental clarity and they lose self-consciousness and forget about their anxieties in everyday uh, problems. So they talk about so it's when someone talks about being in the zone, that's what they're doing. And they say that that's when they feel most intensely alive and in control. And that issue about feeling in control in extreme environments uh, also comes up in another motivation which we found, which is people who are going into extreme environments kind of to escape from those everyday anxieties. And this is Vera Van Shaik, who's a, a cave, di cave diver known for chasing depth records. So she's there with a little plaque with, uh, I think it says 221 meters on. That was the depth that she got to, and she became, she got the record for uh, the deepest woman at that time in terms of diving. So she wrote that diving was a haven that allowed me to escape from me. My personal life was this, was this world of confusion, stress and fear in which I struggled on a daily basis to cope, never mind find any form of control. And diving was a place of peace and calm in which I excelled. So this is quite interesting. You have people who are going into extreme environments because they feel anxious and out of control and they go into extreme environments to feel that. And that's been backed up by some research by uh, some guys at Bangor University who've looked at mountaineers, again, finding high levels of trait anxiety, so they're anxi anxious in real life, which then drops when they are mountaineering. It's really interesting. Another very common motivation is, is curiosity, and specifically scientific curiosity. This is Natalie Cabral. She's a scientist who's absolutely passionate about finding out how organisms evolve in hostile conditions, because that's what gives us clues to how life might develop in other planets. And you don't find those kind of conditions in the safety of the lab. And I think you've had some lectures in this series already on uh, extremophiles, so organisms that live in these very hostile environments, extreme environments. So I want you to imagine Natalie Cabral. She tells this story a few years younger than she is in this photo. And she goes into her uh, office of her boss at NASA, and she says, hey, chief, I got this bright idea. I want to climb a 20,000-foot volcano in South America. So it's very thin air at the top of that. Oh, by the way, the volcano is not extinct. And there's a lake on top, and I want to dive in that lake. It's almost freezing. Oh, and something else, I'm a free diver. I don't use oxygen. So there she is in front of that lake. Why would she do that? Well, because high-altitude volcanic lakes are a good analog for extraterrestrial conditions. And so she had to become a mountaineer and a diver to study the organisms that live in them. She didn't. Her motivation was not being a mountaineer or a diver. Her motivation was science. But she holds the world record for high-altitude free diving. That experience, diving in that lake at 20,000 feet, 
ice cold and hypoxic. She described it as the most rewarding experience of my life so far. So passionate curiosity is something that takes scientists to the extremes. And finally, we need to talk about challenge and accomplishment. This is Molly Hughes, who in 2012 became the youngest woman ever to climb Mount Everest. A couple of years ago, she climbed it again from the north side, so she's the first English woman to have successfully summited both sides. And she did that not for science uh, or for escape or for any of those kind of things, but because she wanted the challenge. She'd interviewed Everest climbers and thought, yeah, I want to see if I can do that. So that's what she did. And that issue of kind of personal challenge is one that comes up an awful lot in our research because overcoming those challenges provides people with this immense sense of satisfaction and achievement and self-efficacy. And we know that achievements are really fundamental human drive, along with the need to belong and along, for, along with the need for status and, and respect. So it's important for all of us, but it's important for some people more than others. We know that exposure to and overcoming stresses can have lasting benefits, and there's plenty of evidence, both from the research and from the accounts of people who experience expedition environments, that people who have these kind of challenging experiences come out of them with a whole array of psychological benefits, including greater resilience, self-confidence, knowledge about themselves, some deep friendships, and of course the joy of scientific discovery. And studies consistently find that they tend to look back on those experiences positively and say that their lives have been fundamentally changed for the better by experiencing the challenges of extreme environments. But just because you find benefits doesn't mean it's going to be easy. In fact, it's precisely because it's hard that the end result is positive. So if you talk to people in the adventure community, sometimes they'll talk about type one fun and type two fun. So type one fun is just fun in the moment, it's pleasure. Type, fun, type two fun is not fun in the moment, it's horrible in the moment, but it's fun in retrospect. And then sometimes they also talk about type three fun, which isn't fun at the time or in retrospect, and you kind of like, no, you never do it again. So one of, one of the people I interviewed not that long ago um, gave, a really, gave us some really interesting quotes about this. So he, he's someone who'd been on a couple of really brutal polar expeditions, and he talked a, a lot about all the unlovely aspects of those expeditions. But one of his most telling ex observations came when I asked him, before he went on his most recent polar expedition, what, what was he expecting it to be like? And he went, oh, it was going to be miserable. Because <laughs> anything you do in a polar environment is going to be miserable, because you're never warm, you're on the ice for 35 days, you're just cold the entire time, utter misery, can't get enough food down your head, everything's difficult at minus 50, it's just miserable. And then he stopped, and then a smile came over his face, and he went, but it's great. <laughs> And this is what he went on to say. He said, uh, some of the most miserable times are the best times. Some of the most entertaining moments in my life were some of the most miserable soul-destroying moments. I won't say it defines you, but it defines something about you. So I think that's kind of the message I want to end on, which is thriving at the limits is not thriving uh, in spite of hardship. It's thriving because of the hardship. So that was a very quick rattle through uh, an awful lot of material. There's more in the book, and I just wanted to give a shout out to uh, my research collaborators, Nathan Smith, Liv Brown, and my co-author, Paul Martin. Big thank you to Oxford University Press and to the Science Gallery. Thank you. Emma was very worried that she would go over time, but I think we'll all agree just, she just definitely <laughs> nailed it. <laughs> Uh, it was an absolutely fantastic talk. Um, I'm sure everyone has a couple of questions that they might like to ask, so I think we'll open it up to the floor. Or maybe not. Just while watching, I, I want to know where you see or where the place of luck comes in in all of this. I just see, when I see people on the tightrope, were they, were they just lucky? Where was luck you know, <laughs> when one guy went down the crevice and the other guy didn't? Yeah, so that is a really good point, and luck obviously does play an important part, and that's why you can never eliminate the risks. Um, and so when you talk to people who do this, they won't say that they eliminate risks. They say they do their very best to control it, and they'll talk about themselves as being control freaks. So there comes, there comes a point where you know, things can just conspire uh, to bring you down. But there are things that if you don't do them, 
you're going to get you're more likely to get unlucky and you're more likely for that unlucky event to lead to disaster so bill stone who's um, quite a well-known caver in the us um, has a really nice quote he says you've got to treat a cave as if it's actively out to get you so when he plans to go caving he he plans for everything that could possibly go wrong so that's a way you know you can't eliminate risk and you get, might be unlucky but you do your best to manage it and um, that was fascinating thank you very much so I know that the, um, the US Navy have done a lot of studies in respect of when the Navy SEALs are in kind of high-stress situations mm -hmm. and when their amygdala is triggered on the frontal cortex is kind of for the reason that to overcome their stress situations, they put them through training and training and training and that subdues their, react their reaction in terms of like doing the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a bit about um, how visualization plays a role in that? Because I've used vis visualizations in flight training, mm -hmm. sitting on a chair, and we do what's called chair um, training, and it's been phenomenal. So can you talk a bit about that role? Yeah, sure. So um, I think what you're talking about there is something they call stress inoculation. So you go through a stressful situation in a controlled environment over and over again. So you learn how, you re how your body reacts and how you think about it. And the more you can expect how your body's going to react, the more you can kind of control your reaction to it. So I think that's what yeah. you're talking about. In terms of visualization, it's a really interesting point because one of the challenges about extreme environments is it's quite, hap quite hard to have those kind of experiences over and over again in situ, in real life situations. So you have to train in an analog environment or you have to do what you said there. You have to, think, you have to run through a kind of visualization exercise instead. Um, so a lot of the research on analog, in, um, uh, analog training environments suggests that obviously you need to have it as close as possible to the real thing, but as long as you get certain bits right, so realistic stresses uh, and the ability to kind of immerse yourself in it in a sort of a, in a kind of high fidelity way, uh, that's going to have the most benefits. Does that kind of yeah. fit with what you were? I just want to, has virtual reality taken a part in that kind of training? Uh, I don't know of any studies that have done that. There are there are a couple of companies that will uh, sell you virtual reality headsets so you can kind of climb Everest in in virtual reality. What would be very interesting is so they, they're selling it. Not I mean they say they're selling it as a training aid, but no one's as far as I know done the studies to show that that can actually help and people who do that are better. Intuitively, you'd say it probably would do, and that would be a really interesting study to do though. I found that to be a really thought-provoking and interesting talk. Thanks a million. Thank you. Um, the question that came to mind for me was, towards the end there, you were describing the, um, the Antarctic ex exhibition chap who um, sort of grinned despite the misery. He said mm. it was fantastic, it was great. Mm. And I'm just wondering, with a lot of people, they may have that huge sense of achievement and survival and, 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 uh, and that from it, but I'm wondering about the people who don't come out sort of intact and who live with horrendous post-traumatic stress and that sort of thing. Yeah, and, and there are plenty of those as well. And you know, we could I could have done a different lecture, which is kind of all the bad, all the bad outcomes. Um, it, it's not the norm, which is the first thing to say, but it, it, it would certainly be wrong to pretend that people don't come out with problems. Um, there's quite a well-known case at the moment um, with Sarah Outen, who did the kind of around the world, uh, human powered around the world trip. Um, and she's written quite a lot recently on her struggle, mental struggles coming back from that. So she has sort of post-traumatic stress flashbacks to a time when her boat sank um, and the trauma around that, but also the sort of depression of coming back and not having anything else to do. And, you know, you've done this big thing, what do you do next? Um, there are other cases. So Buzz Aldrin is a really good kind of iconic case of someone who, when he came back from the moon, it's like, what do I do now? <laughs> you know, what do you do in the age of whatever he was in 30? I've done something that everyone wants to do. And he spent a lot of time in depression, alcoholism, going through one marriage after the other. The reason he bounced back was because he found a new purpose, which is encouraging space for, um, space for the um, exploration for the next generation. Um, so mental health and the impact of extreme environments on long-term mental health is on our uh, to-do list for the research. We've done a little bit of it working with um, volunteers who go out in, so young people who go out into development placements to kind of look at the impact of that on their mental health and the impact of going out if you happen to have a mental health issue before you go out. Um, but it's still very early days on that. Mm. Yeah, just two uh, similar questions. If um, in extreme conditions, um, either individual or group gets into difficulty, significant difficulty, 
generally, is there any evidence whether it's better that they stay where they are and uh, wait for help or try to uh, get out of the situation themselves? And then the other sort of aspect is, um, again, in team, in team uh, situations, um, usually is it, is it the, the dynamic in the team that is the greatest challenge and difficulty or is it the physical conditions? <laughs> Okay, so the first question, um, I, I'm going to give a very typical psychologist answer and says it completely depends. Um, so there, there are um, examples of people who, who have tried to make it out on their own and if they'd stayed where they were, they would have been rescued. And then there are other examples of people um, who, who did make it on their own and if they'd stayed where they were, they would, would never have been rescued. So it kind of depends in, entirely on the circumstance. If you are putting together a really well-prepared expedition, you'll have thought through those eventualities, you'll have thought through the drills, you know, if this goes wrong or this goes wrong or this goes wrong, what happens? You'll have left tripwires with people back home to say, you know, if you don't hear from me at such and such a time, then send help. So it kind of it kind of depends. The other question was around teamwork, so... Yeah, the, sometimes is it, is it the, if, the, if there's a very challenging situation, mm. Yeah, so certainly some, some expedition goers that I've spoken to about, and in particular around this issue of teams. So my PhD student Liv is doing her PhD on team cohesion in extreme and challenging environments. Um, and they'll say that what, one of the things that happens when there's a big crisis is people do tend to come together. It's when there aren't crises that people fall apart. And of course, if they've fallen apart before the crisis, then it's hard to pull them back together again. Um, so again, it, it's another it depends answer. Um, a, a, an awful lot of people we've spoken to who have gone out, uh, who are relatively inexperienced expedition goers, when they come back, say that they completely underestimated how important the interpersonal stresses were. So they'd done a lot of training for the physical stuff and a lot of preparation, and they, you know, they got all their kit together and they spent a lot of time on their kit, and they hadn't thought about the psychological preparation and they hadn't thought about the interpersonal preparation. So it's very easily neglected. Um, I was just. The climber, Alex Honnold, does, um, mm. certainly at least on one of, one of his climbs, he, uh, he talked about freezing, absolutely mm. freezing, about halfway up, and managed to work his way past that. And you yeah. talked about the, um, the cliff diver who looked at um, ways to work past the fear before doing the jump. Is there any research on building past that freeze moment? Because obviously most of the people that talk about their uh, make it through these are the ones that survive and the ones that get past the freeze. Right. They, yeah. uh, is there any kind of research on that? How do they work their way past those moments of complete fear? So it comes back to that, uh, you know, understanding the components of fear. So your freeze response is your physiological response. If you know that that's connected also to your cognitive response, um, then you can use your thoughts to try and, con uh, you know, de to try and uh, control the emotional, physical response. Um, so I know the, the, I mean, the example you talked about is a really interesting one. So he was halfway up um, Half Dome, I think, on Yosemite, and, uh, and he's written about it in his book. But later on, he went and did um, a whole load of tests that were scanning. Let's go back to looking at his amygdala response, uh, Alex Honnold, and they found they basically didn't have an amygdala response. He seemed to have completely damped down that fear response. So I was quite surprised to, realize, to read that he'd, he'd found himself in that situation of being completely frozen. Yeah, the, w the way you snap out of it is to remain calm or try and remain calm and distract yourself and tell yourself you can do it. And I don't, are there any climbers? Yeah, you're a, you're a climber. So there, I'm, I'm a baby, baby climber. But there is that point sometimes when you're sort of there and all of a sudden you think, I can't do this. It's a really long way down. It's a really long way up and I'm just stuck. And you just have to breathe and remind yourself you made the last one. <laughs> so you can probably make the next one as well. Yeah. I think we'll just do two more questions. I think we have one at the back there and one here. Uh, yeah. Me as a, uh, hello. Um, sorry, uh, this might be a bit of an unfair question because nobody knows the answer really to it. But there's a, a lot of a lot of talk about a mission to Mars and mm. it taking nine months. And do you have a sense whether that would be one individual? or a team. I get a sense that a team would probably be more likely, but obviously require a much bigger commitment mm -hmm. to get a whole bunch of people willing willing to go. 
But I wonder, do you have a view on one person versus team for a journey like that? For a journey like that, definitely a team, but you want to pick them really carefully. There, there's a huge, there is a huge amount of work going on, a huge amount of research going on, uh, funded by people like NASA and the European Space Agency, into how do, you, how do you pick the best team, how do you train the best team to work together when they're going to be isolated for really long periods of time. So there was one study called the Mars 500 study, where they basically locked six um, astronauts up and cosmonauts up in a, uh, a mocked-up space station in a car park in Moscow. <laughs> and they basically simulated the entire trip, the hundred, I think 105 days altogether. Uh, and they did it with also in the most realistic way possible. So they kind of one of the things that will happen the further you get away from Earth is it'll take a long time to get the communications back and forth. So they kind of lengthened all of that. Um, and there were lots of a lot of psychologists studying those six guys <laughs> in that car park in Moscow, and and some of uh, so there's some interesting stuff that's come out of that. So some of them were very resilient and they they were f they were fine. Others really weren't that fine um, <laughs> when they came out. So you have to pick it. There's other studies that have been done looking at couples in extreme environments. So one of the theories is well maybe if you send a man and a woman or you know several couples or you know two romantic partners or whatever off to Mars, maybe they'll get on better uh, than, <laughs> than if you just throw a load of people in and kind of expect them to be celibate for, uh, for a long period of time. So there's all sorts of other interesting things we can talk about around that. But yeah, so there's a lot of studies, but definitely I think sending one person on their own for th however many years it is to get there and back again would be a really cruel thing to do. Yeah. Uh, hi, thank you for a fascinating talk. Um, to go back to the question about the, the climber, I'm kind of wondering, is there any evidence that people who may suffer from, say, dissociation, um, you know, people that may have personalities that are slightly ungrounded, may be, in fact, able to sidestep the fear, hmm. you know, through, um, through, in a sense, not being in some way present in their body for, for, um, for those fear moments? That's a really interesting question. So I'm, again, I'm not aware of any studies that have looked at, at that. They've, you know, there are some studies of person, you know, personality studies of climbers and, and other people who go into extreme environments. I'm not aware of any that have kind of picked up um, things like dissociative personality disorders in there. But there is there is some uh, there is some research looking at that kind of actual experience. So I talked about Dean Potter, who's got the, who, who was talking about being at one with the rock and melded with the environment. That happens a lot in extreme environments. There are a lot of accounts of people saying that they, they felt at one with the environment. They felt um, it's somewhere bigger than just them. There was, there's a study of uh, mountaineers and uh, hallucinatory experiences where a lot of them, again, these are mountain, people without any brain injuries or anything perfectly normal, but above 6,000 meters, um, feeling, having sort of out of body experiences, seeing themselves projected out from the rock. You know, and, it, and it seems to be something that, you know, it's a hallucination experience that's exacerbated by stress and dehydration and hunger and fatigue and, and these kind of things. Um, so, not seen anything about a personality trait, but it's certainly something that happens. I think we're going to wrap there. Um, I okay. think everyone will agree it was an absolutely fantastic talk, and I think there's a lot of food for thought. Thank you. If anyone does have any more questions, Emma's details are above. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.